So um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I just want to thank uh, uh, everybody for attending. Our uh, distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Voropol, is very interesting and particularly interesting uh, here you uh, present that challenge and lay that down for the market. I think uh, having attended these in various jurisdictions around the world for the last six years, um, the fact that the FCC is so active here sponsoring this event and participating in this manner is a very positive sign that I think underpins the potential for crowdfunding and what I'm going to talk about, the broader crowd-based business models uh, within the region. So congratulations. And thank you also to True Corporation for helping to make this possible and uh, Ms. Greg Hong Singh and uh, her team uh, who've done an excellent job. Um, so for my sins, I have been um, working in this particular space for uh, six years now. Um, we, um, let me just actually check, I can use the control. Oops. Where's the, um, where's the receiver for this? Am I on? Where's the target? Does anybody know which? <laughs> I just want to be careful I don't laser a member of the audience here. Where is the, uh, where's the receiver for this? Let me get this right beforehand. I have a tendency to talk and ignore the slides anyway, so. Maybe somebody else should drive. Just make sure I'm, I'm doing this right. Is it? Oh, there you go. Okay. You're not? Okay. So, uh, let me, looks like I've got, uh, I was asked um, to um, provide a little bit of context setting. So um, obviously the primary focus here is around uh, what we're calling crowdfunding. Um, Hong Sing mentioned the word crowdsourcing. So if we thought we were coming here to learn about crowdfunding and that was new and complex enough, I don't want to make the problem even bigger. But I think it's really important to understand uh, what's going on in particular relation to um, just crowd-based models in, in general. Um, so I mentioned uh, the work that we do is primarily with large enterprises, governments within the startup um, arena, et cetera, we work uh, all around the world helping devise enterprise, devise and implement enterprise strategies, as well as national strategies for the development of these models. I'm going to ignore these here. Okay, there you go. I can't... Uh, do this here so I can actually see there's no there's no monitor in front of me so this um, I, I asked about the nature of the audience here in terms of who we were presenting to so it's 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 interesting and it's opportune but it's also very diverse so I was told there's potentially about 40% of the people here are from the public sector working within the agencies or within government about 30% maybe from the startup community uh, and then maybe about 30% um, other constituents for example large enterprises so for each of those different audience groups, there are different aspects of this that are interesting. So um, I'm going to try and throw the net wide enough to try and touch on things that are of particular interest to different members of that audience. So hopefully all of it will have some interest, but certain areas will have something in particular. Um, when you're considering participating or sponsoring or even challenging these types of new models, um, I think it's important to have the contextual understanding so you know, we understand what, what's happening here. And the, obviously the outcomes that we're seeking here are to try and inspire, to enable people to be better positioned to take some, some action and to mobilize their teams. Um, one of the key messages is you'll hear a lot of discussion over the next two days around crowdfunding and capital. But, but what I'm going to talk about in terms of the digital economy and crowd-powered business in general is it's a, it's a lot more than just being about capital. Um, it's about the opportunity for social economic impact. Um, it's a manner, a model to foster innovation, to spur entrepreneurship, to, to, uh, to uh, fuel uh, ideation, um, meaningful engagement with customers, with citizens, as I'm going to give you some examples of the ways that certain countries are using crowdsourcing to create more open dialogue with their people. It's about capital formation and it's about job creation. So I've been working in um, sort of for about 25 years now, watching how the distribution of work has been moving further and further away from the enterprise. And about six years ago, um, after probably 
20 years working in sort of the outsourcing and offshoring, uh, uh, offshoring space, you know, it became very standard for large companies to move work to third parties. So, so the workers were getting further and further removed from where the work, uh, where the consumers of the product of the work uh, were, 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 were residing, okay? Um, obviously, um, in the crowd-based based business model, that takes that distribution to, to the next level. So part of the crowd-based business model structure is really around the capacity that you get access to related to labor. And that can be just production capacity for people to do low value, high volume tasks, or it can be pockets of expertise to solve very complicated problems or to participate in research and development and things of that nature. Um, it can be um, in the provision of, of opinion. So what does the market tell you and how does the market feel? And that can be whether you're a large enterprise um, or whether you're an entrepreneur that are looking to crowdfund and launch a product. Um, and then it's about the resources that the crowd has access to as well. So as this category has grown and continues to be defined, um, you know, we have, there's spare rooms in my house in Los Angeles. There's, uh, my car is parked at the airport. There's a lot of, uh, and I'm not using it, there's a lot, I hope it's still there anyway. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of capacity and resources that we have as a crowd, as a community, that are being pulled through these different types of associations. So think about it as labor, think about it as resources, and think about it as, as sort of expertise as well as, uh, as well as effort. So what's actually causing this to happen? Why is this happening now? Um, the truth of the matter is that our desires as consumers, or our, our, our desires as, as people, um, has been ahead of the technology's ability to enable us to participate and, and behave in the way that we'd wanted to do. We've all experienced democratization across a whole number of different areas. You know, we can publish our own news, we can publish our own content. When we buy products, we care about what each of, each of us say about the products as opposed to paid crit, uh, critiquers. Um, so democratization has now really hit finance. Um, you know, we have a desire to build what we want to consume as opposed to just be passive uh, consumers. Um, there's, I think it's 2.6 billion, approaching 3 billion people online at the moment, okay? Um, the, the amount of capacity driven by changes in workforce structures and our own preferences for how we spend our time has meant there's this abundance of capacity, um, tremendous networks of people that are online. So the next generation of the implementation, the adoption of these people is around how do you take these very significant communities, this tremendous capacity, all of this social media network, and turn it into something useful and something productive. Um, no longer are enterprises trying to solve all problems themselves. When Lafley took over P&G 2005, about 85% of the products were invented inside P&G, and his ambition was to change that very dramatically, and I think now maybe 40% of P&G's products are invented internally, the majority therefore being um, created, researched, and developed externally. So the traditional models for enterprises in terms of how complex problems are solved um, have changed very, very significantly. Um, enterprises have now got over the issue regarding the adoption of cloud-based services. Um, and our acceptance of these is driving standardization into business processes. And that makes it much easier to integrate pockets of um, labor and, and define discrete activities within those business processes that can be crowdsourced. Uh, mobile internet, accessibility of internet in terms of broadband access and things of that nature. Disruptive technologies such as automation, uh, for, especially for knowledge work, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, the ability for systems to make good judgments and accurate judgments and very quick judgments in terms of the performance of, of work. And this may not sound like crowdfunding, okay, but I'm going to show you some examples in a minute where very large corporations are using crowdfunding to create much better market demand signals in terms of consumer desires and behaviors. And that is done through the, the algorithms and the judgments that are being made that are being applied to some of these large crowdfunding sites. Um, affordable and secure payment systems and regulatory oversight. So the ability to move money around the internet safely and uh, cost effectively. 
Um, and then obviously the ability and the innovation that's being driven by our friends who are creating these web-based portals um, that are very, they're very different in the nature of the interact interactivity that they offer. Um, can I have my bottle of water? Would you mind handing that up? So year on year, um, the participation both from, um, both from in terms of the capacity that's coming onto the market and in terms of the activity, the number of campaigns, the number of workers that are appearing on crowdsourcing sites, the number of campaign owners on crowdfunding sites, exponential growth, more than doubling uh, every year. Um, the traditional model for how to think about labor is fundamentally being disrupted. So captive labor models, and what we mean by captive labor models is dedicated groups of people, whether they're remote or whether they're in a facility, um, does not work anymore in terms of agility, in terms of speed, and in terms of making sure that that group of people have what you need, both from a capacity point of view in terms of uh, um, uh, production and also from a knowledge point of view. Um, I talk a lot about enterprise, but enterprise are the consumers of this and obviously even from a crowdfunding perspective, as soon as the crowdfunding portals started reaching volumes and reaching a trajectory that made them very significant in terms of the creation of a shadow banking ecosystem, the institutions and the large, fin the, the large financial institutions and the uh, venture capital markets and P markets started to take note. So as much as obviously crowdfunding is being driven through a grassroots um, uh, evolution, probably a revolution, um, the relevance of the larger enterprises starting to participate is a game changer in terms of you know, um, how it appears on people's radars and things of that nature. Um, we are directly involved now in working with governments on how to adopt these models, not, not to um, get in the way of traditional or, or natural market development, but to participate in an intentional way to, to guide better and faster and safer outcomes for people. So these crowd-based models um, are very important in terms of the way that governments now think about setting things like jobs policy, thinking about how to regulate uh, and support new capital formation, new capital markets and things of that nature has, has been expressed. Okay, and clearly from the John, you know, John Public uh, perspective, Joe Public perspective, Tremendous new opportunities for us to participate in this marketplace, either as workers, either as entrepreneurs looking to raise funds, um, you know, a, a game changer in terms of the nature of work and the way that we can change the supply chain, so to speak, and reach our customers and reach our market and reach our, the people that are going to finance us much more directly. So just really quickly at this point I'm just gonna split it there's a couple of slides on each we're going to talk about the crowdsourcing and then we're going to talk about crowdfunding and I won't spend too much time because uh, there were some good definitions provided earlier and I know there's going to be a lot more discussion on this but from a crowdsourcing point of view think about it as labor okay it's an online distributed model for production so getting work done for problem solving uh, which can be things like ideation it can be idea generation and things of that nature, and for opinion gathering, for assessing the market's perception and views. Now, if you combine that with voting with capital, of course, you have crowdfunding. So there's, there's the overlap. Many of the, uh, of the constructs of the crowdsourcing model are obviously embedded within the way crowdfunding works. Um, if it's about capital and market testing, it's usually called crowdfunding. If it's about the labor a bit without the capital, it's usually called crowdsourcing. Um, so um, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but crowdsourcing, um, think about it from a continuum of work. You've got very simple tasks, which are called micro tasks, um, going through a range of requiring additional expertise through to very co more complex problems uh, that are uh, ideation-based tasks. So there's this whole range that requires different levels of skill, different levels of knowledge, different incentives to engage the crowd, different manners to uh, compensate people. People don't do, well, I was gonna say people don't do micro-tasks for free. 
but they do. Um, over dinner last night, we were talking about examples of where you might be playing a game on Facebook and actually you're solving a science problem and you don't even know it. When we go onto a website and we do those horrible captures and we do the one that's easy to get right and then we see another one with a line through it that's harder to read, it's harder to read because somebody is asking us to validate that data. They're crowdsourcing our time in order to improve the data that they have on those data sets. But Microsoft's tasks are typically paid for tasks. At the other end of the spectrum, um, people compete in ideation type of challenges, really for uh, either for prize money, but the majority of people do it for the challenge, for the altruistic value and altruistic benefit. And this is the last slide on, on crowdsourcing. I'll give you a few examples. The other thing that's really interesting and I think useful to remember is there's basically, and this applies to crowdsourcing or, or crowdfunding, okay? There are four basic ways to interact with the crowd, okay? The first is distributed human intelligence tasking. Basically, you can ask the crowd to perform work. So you can put a job in there and wait for a worker to pick it up, or you can find a worker. The second is managed asset discovery. It's about knowledge discovery in a, in a guided and orchestrated manner. So you're going out and using the crowd to identify and organize information. The third is broadcast search. So there's somebody out there with an answer to a given problem. It might be P&G trying to solve a chemistry problem or something, um, but you, you can't find that person and you use crowdsourcing mechanisms in order to enable the crowd and that individual to surface and to use the crowd to give feedback on uh, that person's view. And then the fourth is peer vetted creative process. So this is around using a crowdsourcing model uh, to have not necessarily an empirically correct or an empirically right answer in case one doesn't exist, but it's really about market perception. So in the case of crowdfunding, this would be around using the crowd to validate ideas and to demonstrate that validation through their participation, either through comments or feedback. Did I have that up? So let me just pause there and have another sip. So referring to crowdfunding then, so any form of capital formation where both the funding needs and the funding purpose are communicated online, typically online, um, and broadly via an open call that can be evaluated by a large group of individuals, the crowd. So there's just a couple of caveats to that. Um, in certain marketplaces, and the US in particular, um, confidence in the market, um, the ability through uh, bodies such as the consumer protection um, bodies to make sure that consumers are protected, um, confidence and trust in the financial systems, etc., means that a lot of crowdfunding can be done in a, in, on an online automated way. We did a lot of work in Mexico, and obviously one of the things we found out there was it's very different. And you know, um, a, a unique and indigenously sensitive way of implementing uh, crowdfunding in particular jurisdictions is very important. So in that particular instance, there was a tremendous amount of work that was being done offline, coupled with the promotion of the offerings online. So I, I um, hesitate to say that crowdfunding is purely an online model, but it usually consists of a, a combination of both. Um, it's a many-to-one model. Um, one of the things that's changing in this regard is as the particularly debt-based, the, um, the uh, peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms are getting very significant, um, Prosper has now exceeded over $4 billion in debt-based crowdfunding and lending, uh, lending Club has now exceeded $2 billion. As those types of platforms continue to get uh, to that size or have reached that size and beyond, um, there's obviously a lot more institutional money that's now coming into that marketplace. So one of our challenges obviously is either redefining the crowd, the makeup and the composition of the crowd or being able to somehow delineate if we choose to do so and, and try and define sort of the institutional money uh, versus the, um, you know, the, the, the individual private investor money. But predominantly, whether it's a large fund, an institution electing and making decisions on behalf of a crowd, um, or whether it's individual participants, individual investors making choices on specific ventures or specific entrepreneurs, um, it has to typically be a many-to-one type of model, not a one-to-one -one model. Um, the crowdfunding portal obviously is the intermediary 
takes, takes on different responsibilities based on which model of crowdfunding. Um, obviously, in a non-financial, it's a donation, a reward-based, uh, you know, they're pretty self-sufficient, they're pretty all-encompassing in terms of their ability to um, promote the offering, consume, you know, consummate the transaction, etc. In a securities-based world, sometimes those portals are intermediary where the closing of the, the sale of the security is done offline, possibly with relationships with a dealer broker, for example, in the US if the crowdfunding portal isn't licensed to operate in that manner. Um, the four types of crowdfunding were mentioned. Um, I'll just mention quickly, and again, uh, others will say the same. One of the emerging models, which we're going to cover in this year's research report, is the um, continued growth of royalty-based crowdfunding. And royalty-based crowdfunding being basically that the investor receives um, a share of an income stream, which is obviously either income generated through an equity uh, sale of an equity or um, common interest, for example, like a, um, a share of a lease payment on a, on a uh, commercial building or something of that nature. And obviously in a product category, it could pertain to a percentage of revenues on the sale of a product. So let me give you in the last, uh, I've got a few minutes, let me give you some examples. I think um, thinking about this in the context of how do you validate this? Um, how real is this? Where is the market? You know, should Taiwan, um, Thailand, Cambodia, these other countries that are starting to look at this, you know, is, is, is now the time to uh, take some proactive action and, 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 and where, is this, where is this going? So let me, let, me, let me flip through those different models with a number of different examples. And I'm not going to spend particularly long on any of them. So these are some examples of some very large enterprises that are using the crowd to perform some of those micro task type of works. And obviously, I could give lots of examples. Um, I see there in the bottom left, I know Yahoo Japan is very acting. They're building their own crowdsourcing technology platform with a partner of ours. Um, they're using the crowd to do transcription and translation, a lot of localization work. Those are perfect types of use cases where you don't want to hire as a company a particular bench. You might go into a new market as an enterprise. You might to ramp up. You need to ramp up and have a lot of people available to do a certain number of tasks, and you might need to scale that down. Traditional outsourcing models can't do it as quick, can't do it as fast, and you, have to, and you pay for the labor as opposed to paying for, for good work. Um, you see on here, for example, image moderation. Uh, another example, I can see two of those. I can see vendor image moderation in the center with staples. Um, imagine all of the businesses that are very internet-centric, big social media sites, Facebook, Google, eBay, any Amazon, any one of those have thousands and thousands and thousands of crowd workers every day doing um, content moderation on those sites. Um, it's very simple because you can make uh, you can make those tasks. Oh, I didn't do that, did I? It's very simple because you can you can dumb down those tasks into a very very basic form. Okay, so you know you could set up a workflow, for example, for a photo moderation task. You can provide very simple instructions, and you can have a crowd worker uh, making very simple decisions make, uh, based on very very simple instructions. And again, the reason for sharing this is just you know if you're um, if you're an enterprise with capacity, with workers, if you're a, uh, an enterprise looking to create jobs and income for people in you know, marginalized communities, um, you don't need as a worker a high standard of education or even technology proficiency to perform this work. Um, so these types of tasks and many more are very good for creating income opportunities and bringing people onto the, uh, back into the system. Um, you know, enterprise crowdfunding. Um, people often think crowdfunding is about Pebble Watch and you know other examples. And in fact, Pebble Watch is interesting. I don't think it's interesting so much because of the first part of the story. I think what was interesting is VCs turned them down until they raised their $12 million or whatever it was. And then obviously, you know, then VCs were very interested in them and they closed rounds. And that's happened a number of times now. So crowdfunding is proving to be a good way of getting early deal flow for venture capitalists and some market validation. But the reason for bringing these up is, um, you know, this, these are four examples of some very significant enterprises that are doing crowdfunding, not because they're trying to raise capital, these organizations are probably not short of capital, um, but for different reasons. Um, Coca-Cola in Mexico launched its new 
well, its, its water product um, by establishing a crowdfunding property and providing a matching uh, system in order to contribute towards entrepreneurs' campaigns that had a socially beneficial impact on the preservation of water or the distribution of water. So somebody came up, for example, with an idea on how to um, make the use of water th running through a shower system more efficient, and that was one of the examples where Coca-Cola backed it. Now, of course, they're not uh, doing it purely for that reason because they get a tremendous amount of um, kudos with respect to corporate social responsibility and branding and things of that nature. ABN AMRO, um, major Dutch, major international bank based out of uh, Holland, um, received some damage from the financial crisis and in order to um, actively work on uh, repairing that, um, built its own crowdfunding platform where, again, it matches entrepreneurs' contributions and supports entrepreneurs that are uh, embarking upon socially uh, conscious businesses in Holland. But, of course, the other thing it's found out, as well as getting brand benefit, the other thing it's found out is um, that it's an incubator for customers for its products and things. Um, both Procter & Gamble and General Mills are working in the crowdfunding space um, purely as a digital incubator to get access to talent and ideas and IP from the persp perspective of hiring those people or acquiring that uh, intellectual property. Um, just, moving, just moving to uh, what certain countries are doing, and I think a number of you in this room are aware um, in terms of Digital Malaysia, but Digital Malaysia um, is part of the Malaysian government's program to um, create a digital economy and a very competitive economy by 2020. Um, the primary goal was to turn it from a consumption-based um, ethos mindset to a production-based ethos. So there was a tre tremendous amount of people that were on Facebook. It was 13, but there was um, there was it, they, they were mostly consuming content as opposed to using it to generate jobs and to generate income. Um, so moving from a supply to demand, they were very much in the situation of building it, you know, build it and they will come. Let's, but now they're, wait, they're, they're, they're turning that around and allowing the market to determine uh, where certain investments go, where they build out certain things. And then turn it from a low value add knowledge economy to a high value add uh, economy. Um, these are the, so these are the challenges or these are the goals with, with respect to um, the 2020 goals. So we're very instrumental and involved in this program. Um, ultimately, they're looking to create an additional 7,000 ringgit per month, uh, per, per year, uh, which I think is about $2,500 for 400,000 citizens by 2020. Um, uh, if anybody wants to talk to me more about that program, we can do it afterwards. But the next phase of the program is the creation of what we call e-reziki centers, which are digital hubs, training environments for workers from either urban or rural communities to come in. We're developing training programs to enable the Malaysian workforce to become more competitive than other nations' workforces when competing in this digital marketplace. So we have training, we have programs around demand generation, we're building very, sophistic te very sophisticated technology to manage and curate the national workforce at a national level. We'll be the first country to have uh, ever done that. Um, very quickly, Saudi Arabia, it wasn't one I would have anticipated, but they're using crowdsourcing to create um, policies and culture around open government, engaging citizens through crowdsourcing in government policy making. Again, a, an interesting example came up over dinner last night where one of the things that Saudi is doing is using citizens to report um, employment law violations on a crowdsourcing platform. So if workers, if citizens identify a factory, for example, that is not providing the proper facilities or is, is, is hiring underage workers, then this system will enable the community, the crowd, to report that information. And the conversation last night was, just imagine if you could create a similar type of environment where people could securely and in confidence of not being compromised, report information, for example, around sex, uh, the trafficking of children, for example. Um, so those types of systems that allow you to have you know, many millions of more eyes on the street 
in an environment that it makes it very easy for people to share that information can be very fundamental and, and obviously highly valuable. Um, and then Mexico who developed, um, who looked at how to orchestrate, how to design and orchestrate a strategy for crowdfunding as a nation. And this was a really good example supported by a development bank, Inter-American Development Bank, um, where it was recognized that uh, some intentional participation in the creation of that market by facilitating it, by bringing key actors together, etc., cetera, um, would create a safer and better market. One really important thing that came out of that, I think there was many, was the recognition that non-financial return crowdfunding, primarily donation-based and reward-based crowdfunding, typically precedes uh, the formation of securities-based crowdfunding in any jurisdiction. It's very unusual for any securities-based crowdfunding to flourish if there hasn't been a good bedrock of um, non-financial crowdfunding. The reason being is obviously it establishes um, experience, it, it establishes consumer trust, it builds an entrepreneurial base through which they can create and manage those platforms. In some marketplaces, like Mexico, um, even though that's not a security and therefore it doesn't have to be regulated, one has to make sure that in building that marketplace it doesn't bite itself in the foot by creating the problem that stops the securities market flourishing. So it's not a question of creating it and letting it go. In marketplaces where there aren't such good consumer protections or there are lower levels of consumer trust, you still have to participate in that to make sure that it provides the bedrock that it's, uh, you're seeking it to, uh, to achieve. So I think we're there, and I'm only about a minute over. Um, the last example I wanted to share was um, how is crowdfunding working for entrepreneurial ventures? Um, and let me give you this, this is a, a really nice example. So Wacker Wacker Lights, Off Grid Solutions, um, is a Dutch organization. Um, December 2001, they went to a Dutch equity-based crowdfunding platform, Simbid, and raised, I think it was 75,000 euros, you can probably see better than I can, of startup capital. So they got their initial funding through equity-based crowdfunding. Um, shortly after that, they went to market with their first product, um, which was the Wacker Wacker Light. And this was a solar-powered light, um, and they raised from 787 backers, 50,000, nearly $50,000. And again, m my version here is a bit small. You can probably see how much they overshot there. How much they overshot. But, um, so not only are they raising the capital they require, but they're also building, they're also getting market data, and they're also starting to build a loyal following as they go through this process. The second Kickstarter, pro, uh, the second six, uh, Kickstarter project, um, which was to enhance the, the, the light, um, they finished up raising 419,000. And I, I can't see because of the size here, but I know that was many, many, many times oversubscribed against uh, the fund that they were looking to raise from 5,622 uh, backers. So they started off with an equity campaign. They did two reward-based campaigns. And then at this point, they started um, including a sort of a social mission um, partnering with Uganda um, to distribute one million of these lights uh, throughout Uganda, um, and then initiating on their own platform a buy one, donate two to Haiti um, in support of the relief campaigns there. So you have a nice example here of a, a business that was created, funded, supported through all of the different forms of crowdfunding, including the donation-based, with a nice uh, social impact mission. So... Um, uh, just a couple of minutes just to close down. Let me talk about just uh, some of the sort of the trends and forecasts and things that we see. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, the composition of the crowd um, is pot potentially changing. And I was a, a sort of a diehard advocate of the fact that crowd was never going to be an institution a few years ago. But of course, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's much more institutional money now coming in, buying up debt on these peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms, for example. So one has to be a little bit open-minded and flexible about that. Um, but a lot of um, institutional investors are looking for much higher income, uh, you know, yield, yield from uh, income-earning assets. I mentioned the peer-to-peer -to -peer space. Um, vertical platforms. So the early crowdfunding platforms were very much focused around discrete models 
So they were reward-based or they were donation-based or lending-based. Um, and they were also typically very broad in terms of the products, the ranges, the geographies that they covered. As the market has continued to develop, um, there's been a lot more focus in terms of virtual speciality, whether that's on a particular demographic or a particular region uh, or something of that nature. Um, Investor-driven, so platforms are becoming much more aware of um, investor preferences in terms of the type of yield, the types of return. Uh, so that's why obviously um, we've seen a lot more development within the peer-to-peer -peer space, uh, 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 for example. Um, much more guaranteed and consistent yield. Um, social impact becoming uh, an investment tenant. Okay, so particularly with Gen Xs and the uh, m millennials, um, investment returns are now not the only driver behind uh, investment decisions that are being made. So we're seeing a lot more um, acknowledgement and importance and decisions being taken uh, for deploying capital based on um, you know, the, the social impact goals of the, of the venture. Um, enterprise crowdfunding, which I've uh, spoken about a little bit earlier. Um, investment in platforms will continue. Um, well over $250 million was invested in CFPs uh, during the course of 2014. Um, obviously a challenge in this regard is, um, you know, the market is not that mature from the perspective of being able to demonstrate year-on-year -year returns. So, the jury is sort of out in terms of what creates value in a platform. Most of the platforms will tell you that it's about deal flow. And there, at the moment, there isn't enough liquidity in that deal flow and enough performance information in that deal flow to really validate that that's more than just uh, a wish and a promise. The other issue that you'll read about if you get hold of our 2015 industry report, which I'll mention a little bit more in a second, is that the concentration of funding, val of funding volume is very much centered in the US around a small number of players, and that's becoming more extreme. Um, let me give you the number there quickly. So in the US in 2004 and 2011, 73% of the funding volume was concentrated in the top five platforms. Um, by 2014, that had increased from 73% to 79.5%. So the big, in America, the big platforms are getting bigger, okay, making it much harder for the, for the new platforms and also making the investors also think and, and challenge. In Europe, however, the concentration of funding volume between the large players and the rest is actually changing. It's reduced something like 30% over the last four years. Okay, so in Europe, much more of a nationally focused, defragmented market uh, with preferences for CFPs in, in individual companies. Um, economic development, uh, we've spoken about that a lot. Um, US states and initiatives, so obviously because of the um, slowdown and the hold up with Title III, which is um, crowdfunding to non-accredited investors, um, many of the states in the US are taking and setting their own policies. Um, and then we're seeing quite a lot of uh, the early stages of international transactions and international expansion with crowdfunding deals being done across different jurisdictions. So just to uh, close here, um, um, it's, I hope, fair for me to mention there's, you know, we have two, uh, we, we, we produce reports on this marketplace every year. Um, we have a very significant report coming out in about two weeks' time on uh, crowdfunding for real estate, crowdfunding for properties. This is a 200-page report, and it surveys all of the crowdfunding real estate platforms. It's a very interesting asset class that's getting tremendous growth. There's very deep information in there around the size of the composition and why, you know, what the intersection of real estate and crowdfunding looks like. Um, and then our industry report is going to hold it back, and it's going to come out a few weeks after that. Um, which gives the validated numbers for 2013, 2014, and projections for 2015. Um, so, and I, th I think conference attendees are able to go to that link and, and, and procure these at a 50% discount. You can you speak to me if you need any help. So, thank you very much for your time. I think that's the last one. And there's plenty of uh, resources and access to resources on our website, crowdsourcing.org. Okay, thank you very much.